A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 324, uh, Back to Basic Module, session 15. Today, we have with us Dr. Manpreet Singh from Advanced IE Center, PGI Chandigarh, talking to us on uh, Essentials of Ophthalmic Instruments, part one. Uh, so, a brief introduction for sir for our audience. Uh, he has done his basic uh, MBBS and uh, MS from uh, Punjab and Chandigarh, and he also has DNB, FRCS, and FICO degrees to his credit. He has done his short-term fellowship in ocular plastics and ocular facial aesthetics from Sri Shankar Devan Netralaya Guwahati in 2014, and short-term fellowship uh, in ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbit, and ocular oncology from the prestigious LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. Currently, sir is an associate professor in advanced. Center PGI Chandigarh and his main areas of interest are uh, ophthalmic plastic surgery, lacrimal surgery, dacryology, ocular facial aesthetics and thyroid disease. A very warm welcome to you sir and over to you. Thank you Shafani. And, uh, thank you for that introduction. It includes uh, I love teaching to my residents and uh, they also sometimes enjoy that. <laughs> so let's and thank you, Dr. Santosh and Avar, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And this is an essential part of, I think, uh, postgraduate learning, which should be uh, uh, told in uh, right in front when they join uh, the MS, that their tools in which, with which they will be working. So they should be taught about it right in uh, at the joining time, rather than when they are going to exit. You know, just 10 to 15 days are left and then the exam is coming up and then they try to learn, I think it's better. So my first slide will tell about it. So can I share my slides? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay. So this is the topic for today. And essentials of ophthalmic instruments. So uh, sir told me to cover, it, cover this in uh, two uh, segments. This is part one. This is a lovely image. No? Everyone tries to be into that, uh, over that seat of bullet going up in the Ladakh and valleys. Now what if, and you know, see see at the back, what, what are they carrying? They're carrying petrol, diesel, everything, you know, what whatever, what they will need during that trip to make, keep it enjoyable and, uh, you know, keep it worthy to remember afterwards. So what are they geared up to? If, you know, they encounter something like this, a very basic, simple tire puncture. So whom they will call? So they have to do it yourself. Right? So this is DIY, what they have to learn. So basically you should know your tools well before whatever you are going to do to make your journey enjoyable and memorable. So this is a puncture kit. Just you should, you have to learn it while when you are going to drive to those beautiful valleys. So when you're going to drive into the OT and uh, having, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, assisting even uh, with patients, with your teachers, and afterwards you're, you'll be stepping into their shoes as surgeons. So you should know your tools. That's the basic mantra What, why, with which we'll be starting this. So my residents, basically, we, they pushed, and this is our experience, which I we compiled in this book, uh, published in Springer by Dr. Paralish Bujani, who is a professor in GMC X32, Septuagint Chandigarh. Uh, so she uh, told me that you can be the co-editor and uh, we published this book, Ophthalmic Instruments and Surgical Tools, which encompass maximum of these uh, the images which I'll be showing. So this is scientifically organized compilation of all the instruments. We published it in 2019, and uh, I would like again uh, to thank my residents and uh, PG exam going specially, who you know literally pushed me to compile this up for once and good. But uh, I still have to do some hard work. So let's first pay tribute to the inventors. The maximum amount of instruments, number of instruments, uh, being contributed by this specific guy, you know, Roman Castrovijo. Uh, he uh, developed the uh, majority of the instruments which you see while operating for cornea and uh, keratoplasties. And Jose Barakwar, who happens to be the father of refractive surgery. 
So remember this, this Jose Baracua, he is the father of refractive surgery and invented many, many instruments which we deal with and play with. So ophthalmic instruments are the fine, delicate ones. They have got business ends or tips which are not visible to the naked eye. And its reuse frequency is uh, much more as compared to the other specialties because of the number of cases. And we do handle fragile tissues like capsule of anterior capsule of the lens, internal limiting membrane, not visible to naked eye and uh, without a magnification and uh, conjunctiva definitely. It's not only about fragile tissues. We do encounter some firm to hard tissues like bone and cartilage while doing oculoplastic surgery specifically. So let's come to the topic. What is a surgical instrument? Surgical instrument is a specially designed tool or a device which is used to perform or facilitate a few specific actions uh, like a surgical procedure or operation for the best possible outcomes with maximum efficiency and minimum number of complications. So what does an instrument? They have actually a specific, uh, specific medical or diagnostic uh, role or a surgical. And the desired effects which we uh, need from our instruments is holding, which is done by forceps, clamps or the needle holders or modifying the biological tissues, which is like cutting, stretching or breaking and to provide access for the viewing the deeper tissues which is done by the retractors or sometimes we use suction for the better view of the deeper tissues. So what about the nomenclature? Why should we try to name the instruments? It acknowledges its inventor whenever we name it. it definitely we do handle it them uh, on the daily basis. So it's not a bad idea to acknowledge them. Uh, and it actually improves the surgeon assistant understanding. Uh, basically, that can be uh, in a better put up. So uh, if you ask your staff or uh, assistant by a name of surgical instrument, okay, hand me over a cat spot retractor or an apps cat spot retractor. So then it's like you have acknowledged that also and you have uh, your assistant will also not be confused. Ki kya hai. So based on that, uh, based on the nomen the nomenclature is based on basically the function what an instrument performs. So is it a forceps or scissor or retractor or clamp? That can be the you know, basic uh, mode by which you can name the instrument or by its appearance. Like, it, does it look like a cat's paw? Like in this picture, this is a cat's paw retractor or a naps cat's paw retractor, better placed. And a mosquito forceps, it's a small, smallest artery available in your armamentarium. And ribbon retractors like this, they look like ribbon and these are malleable surgical retractors. So third uh, point is, it's the name nomenclature is based on the scientific name related to the surgery. It can be so related to the surgery, what we are going to perform, like in a ptosis, we use ptosis clamp. Or in a clasion, we use clasion clamp or a curate, clasion curate. So, based on these, the function, appearance, and the scientific name related to surgery, this can be the instruments can be named. So, try to describe the surgical instrument in the single, simple, and preset pattern whenever you are going to describe it in front of the examiner. So, that time, try to be in a pattern so that examiner understands that you know what you're dealing with or what you're describing. It also makes it easier identification and the description tells uh, the story, the way you describe the instrument. So what are the types of surgical instruments? They can be broadly divided into sharps or blunts. The sharps remain scissors, blades, knives, trocars, you know that trocar is a very sharp thing. This is a VR trocar and uh, trefines we use for cornea, for canaliculus, rounders, bone rounders or punches. And these are all sharps or razor fragments which we earlier used to use for cataract surgery to form the corneal incisions in SICS or something. Now we don't use that. So the other, uh, other instruments can be blunt. 
They include speculum, needle holders, hemostatic clamps like artery, retractors, spatulas, loops. They're like, it will not harm the tissue uh, up front. So just uh, remember that this is a sharp instrument or a blunt instrument. That's a type of surgical instrument. So coming on to the functions of the instrument. The functions are basically holding or grasping the tissue, which is done by forceps, holders or clamps. Or the very important function is cutting, incising, punching or breaking. This is performed by the scissors, blades, knives, chisels, awls, rounders or punches as I have told. So retraction or separation, it's done by speculum, eyelid speculum which we apply before every intraophthalmic procedure. That is a retractor, kind of retractor which keeps the eyelids away or the hooks, iris hooks which we use for uh, small pupils, cataract surgeons or retractors we use for to look at the deeper tissues. Use a uh, NAPS CAT score retractor for doing external DCRs and that. Then comes the aspiration, injection, draining, or irrigation. That's done by the suction tips, needles to do irrigation, catheters, cannulas, syringes, drains. Drains are the, you know they used for to evacuate the blood, blood pus from the in operative field or some cavities sometimes. In orbital abscess when we drain. We put some drain or something like that. So that the uh, the flow is maintained out of the orbit. The orbit remains decompressed. Then the fifth function is probing and dilatation. And uh, so basically to traverse a tubular path and or to widen a small opening, we use probes like lacrimal probe or stillet or dilators for the, for the tubular paths. Then another function is cautery or hemostasis. That is the cautery can be fire heated or electricity heated. So those instruments are specifically designed to work in a vascular region. We do need some kind of, uh, you know, uh, we keep, keep the fluids away before uh, applying this over the tissue so that it functions properly. So suction helps in that. And uh, seventh function is apposition. For that, we use sutures, stickers, tissue glues, or staplers. So tissue glues, uh, you everyone knows that. It's a tissue or a fibrin glue. And uh, we use sutures, everyone use that. Stickers are, uh, you know, for the finer plastic surgeries, we use skin stickers uh, rather than sutures so that uh, there's minimum suture related so, um, impression over the skin and staplers are rarely used in ophthalmology but they are coming up. So let's come to the basic juice of the presentation that's anatomy of the instruments how the instruments are described. So we talked about that they are divided into two types sharps or blunts and then we talked about how they look like and what are their functions what all seven functions we have described. So anatomical description of a surgical instrument, I will start with the first handle, how we handle that instrument. So handle is the main part by which is held in the hand of operating surgeon or an assistant. So it can be a ring handle like this in this image, this is a ring handle, which we have in our artery or the sponge holding forceps and the interlock leaf handles. You must have seen this, this is the handle uh, and self-retaining system also in the mainly the ophthalmic or finer instruments where we need not to put much stress over the you know our interosseous muscles of the hand. And the another one is the grooved handle variety. This is mainly for the awls or punches or rounges uh, to deal with the harder tissues like bone. So these are the handles by which. The instrument is held by the surgeon or the assistant. So first is first thing which you want to describe in front of examiner. Just tell them that this is the handle. Then uh, come to the blade or jaws. So what are blades or jaws? It depends upon the tip or the cutting edge of the two blades of a scissor. If the tip is sharp, like both tips are sharp, sharp, uh, then you can say. The tips are sharp, sharp, or 
blunt blunt like in this example you can see over there this image if you can see my pointer um, yeah now it is visible so this this tip you can see this is the blunt blunt tip both of these and this tip of this scissor is sharp and blunt so this is a sharp blunt tip so the blunt blunt one this one and the sharp blunt one is this one we talked about this is a ring handle and these are the blades and this is the sharp uh, this is a tip a sharp and blunt tip so blunt can be with bevel or without bevel. It depends like your keratome is uh, according to me, keratome. Uh, the fine tip sharp or fine tip blunt it can be. Then you go on to the blade curvature. You can describe it like, is it in the open or closed fashion? You can just uh, see that this is a straight blade and this is a curved blade. It can be angled, you know, sometimes like your Vana scissor. Sometimes you must have seen that's an angled one. It's having an obtuse angle or a bayonet shaped. Bayonet shaped instruments are used for uh, intranasal uh, when you have, uh, you may be uh, doing that nasal packing or removing some something from the nose. Then you need a bayonet shaped instrument so that you can have a good visibility as well as the maneuver uh, maneuverability inside the Cavity is not hampered. Then you come to the fourth point. That's a joint. Joint of an instrument. It's a very critical part of the instrument. As far as it manufacturing, functioning, and most importantly, generally staff don't do it. So from next, from tomorrow onwards, you will be able to see that if the joint is, if it is clogged, your instrument will not work. So this is a very critical part of the instrument as far as it's, it's manufacturing, functioning and cleaning albums. This type of joint is typically present in the sponge holding forceps. This is a box joint. And these, this type of joint where one blade is overlapping the other, this is the lap joint. Lap joint. This box joint is one blade is going inside the other blade. That's a box kind of interlocking. Like, in, like this and you can have a double action joint for some specific bone rounges where you press it and uh, this joint will go out and this joint will go in these are double action type of joints so i'll just go back when you are going to describe then start with the handle of the instruments go to the blade then go to the blade blade curvature you can uh, say along with that and the joint types. What is the type of joint? Then there's a last one, the position retaining system. To retain its original position, uh, there is a lock or a spring. So I told that double uh, leaf spring is a self-retaining system also and its handle also. So double leaf spring is, uh, is uh, most commonly, I think, uh, used retaining system in ophthalmic instruments and uh, others these are the this is a handle of the punch or a bone rounder it also has got a double spring action and this is a ratchet uh, this is a lock which we generally say it's a ratchet lock uh, sponge holding forceps has it which we often use otherwise artery forceps when we do oculoplastic surgeries and we have got a bleeder or something we catch it with the artery and uh, keep it there if we want to uh, use the cautery after some time or you can cauterize it directly. Uh, but till that time, uh, this ratchet handle will not let it go. So you can uh, use the artery forceps to hold the sutures also and uh, not only the bleeding artery and the other tissues also which you might be using. So in these five, uh, if, uh, five types, if in this five, uh, you know, uh, um, Categories, if you can describe an instrument, nothing like that. And your examiner will be impressed. I, I, I can ensure that. This is the sixth one which you can mention if it is there on the instrument. This is the guide pins. Uh, you might have seen this pin like this, this structure over uh, here, especially over a conjunctival scissor or a needle holder. These pins are present on the inner side of the surface of one limb. On the other limb, there's a hole. So one limb has got a pin and other limb has got a hole. 
and uh, when uh, it's to ensure the accuracy of jaws uh, jaws are uh, you know mating properly then only the pin will enter the hole if the pin is not entering the hole that means the jaws have moved to one side so that means your instrument needs replacement or if uh, someone is putting more force than required i think uh, the fresh junior residents probably uh, they they must be uh, feeling the pinch sometimes you know if they press try to grab uh, the tissue with more force then this this pin will protrude and uh, and it, it will poke the finger of the the pulp of the finger and it may also become a source of glove puncture so be careful while uh, doing surgeries uh, on uh, especially on positive patients so basically these are the guide pins if anyone asks this is a guide pin. so this is how the instrument is described in those five uh, uh, types uh, it's five solid parts and the sixth one is a guide pin which you can remember so what let's go back to the from where the instruments are made i'm sure i was not knowing about this before i wrote that book what are the materials we we, we keep on seeing handling them and what is the material i when i look back into that it's a whole lot of science behind it and uh, we are not engineers so but uh, that then i told you that ladakh uh, wala trip you know we have to uh, remember what or uh, you know, be aware uh, what we are dealing with so the majority of the instruments are stainless steel as the most commonly used and available alloy uh, known for its strength corrosion resistance and affordability it's made up of chrome it's actually chromium is added to uh, this alloy to make it corrosion resistant chromium is 12 to 14% and the minimum carbon content of the steel Uh, it uh, renders it at risk for rusting or corrosion so it the carbon content is kept lower the steel you know my je pehli bar pata laga the steel is also like austenitic and martens tick steel of series 300 and 400 i'll tell you the difference the austenitic steel it's non magnetic and non heat treated and has got lower in carbon content so it it is used to make speculums calipers and retractors or the normal instruments but this my density steel it is a heat treated steel and it is strong and magnetic so when what uh, have you ever noticed that if you bring uh, uh, bring your needle holder near a tanzero nylon needle it's uh, it magnetically gets stick to the uh, it's stuck to the needle holder tip that's because it's magnetic and the steel is martensitic you can uh, tell your colleagues if they have not attended this that is a martensitic steel which is magnetic that's why it is the needle is uh, getting stick to this not forceps and uh, sometimes scissors and curettes needle holders cutters trefines are also made up of this steel it's it's strong and robust so this first picture is the steel instrument the second picture uh as we know this material this is titanium let's get to the titanium it's why titanium is in the picture when steel is readily available its qualities are there we can get magnetic also and titanium is basically lighter doesn't put much pressure over the uh, globe it's harder it will stay for long fun spot and uh, stronger but it's costlier it is made up of medical grade alloy is composed of aluminium 4% and vanadium 4% its biocompatibility it's more biocompatible corrosion resistance and non magnetic properties and it is rust proof also makes it ideal as an instrument but you have to pay more for these and that's why it's used to make bone plates we, we, we uh, in orbital fractures we uh, people uh, use uh, titanium in plants in for screws wires artificial joints prosthesis dentistry this this is a corrosion resistant and more biocompatible material and it's rust proof so that makes it ideal to be planted in the body and it, and moreover uh, during surgery you might have 
observed some surface reflections, which is uh, sometimes very bothersome to the predict surgeon or assistant. Uh, titanium doesn't reflect. But remember this thing. I'll be talking about it in the second part of the this uh, webinar. Second part, the day after. That this titanium should not be used in the ultrasonic cleaners because of the it's uh, it is medical grade alloy and the ionizing uh, capacity of that uh, ultrasonic cleaner. So don't use titanium instrument in that steel instrument. You can use. Any guesses for the third one? Third is the uh, tungsten carbide. This alloy contains. It's not gold. Okay, this is not gold. So tungsten carbide, this alloy, it contains carbon and tungsten in equal parts. And it's it's a very hard material used for cutting tools like drills. We use uh, for sometimes for DC or orbital decompressions or burrs and uh, high speed tools, basically. And I can tell you tungsten carbide scissors will stay with you for a lifetime. You can buy once and you know, retire with that. And uh, diamond, yes, the fourth image is uh, of a diamond blade. Keratomes, basically, if you are a rich surgeon, you can buy this. Diamond, by virtue of its durability and sharpness, it will uh, maintain its sharpness. And it has been used to make keratomes, but now Chota Wala used uh, diamond dusted brushes and drills. Drills uh, work absolutely wonderful if you have got diamond uh, dusted drill. And uh, if I'm not wrong, I remember. Uh, uh, my consultant using it for uh, pterygium surgery after removal for polishing that uh, base of the pterygium. That also was diamond dusted. But uh, retina people use that uh, diamond dusted sometimes to lift the iron. And uh, let's not forget about the fiber optics. These are the materials uh, for transmitting the light in the most efficient way from the source to the target organ. And you can uh, of the brilliant examples of LIO, laser indirect of thermoscope, delivers the laser also, endolite also, endolite in the retinal surgeries, nasal endoscopes. So uh, these are the fiber optics. So if um, let's go back to the image. First one is steel instruments. Majority of your instruments will be steel. If you want to purchase something which you want to, uh, you know, very specific for you, like a speculum, eyelid speculum. Pellet speculum is lightweight. Titanium, remember, is lightweight. So you don't want an additional uh, you know, a weight on the eyeball. If you are a VR surgeon, go for this tungsten, uh, sorry, titanium. Uh, this is a, I'll describe it in the slide. So this is a titanium speculum, which is lightweight, which you can use. Tungsten carbide, buy a scissor if you want to buy for tungsten carbide. And diamond, it depends upon your pocket. Fiber optics, we use it. So let's go to the stages of instrument fabrication, how these are made. You know, Discovery Channel, how they tell that how the things are made. So how these instruments are fabricated, these are like uh, some mechanical engineering terms. Forging, milling and turning, then assembly, then filing and grinding, then again heat treated, then again fitting and polishing. After that, final inspection under magnification before, before they are handed over to us. So just see how, how uh, you know, specifically these instruments are made. And uh, out of this, the assembly, the uh, assembly of the instrument is very important. After that, heat treatment at very high temperatures, followed by cooling to make these instruments sturdy. And then after that, Polishing is a, a must for any fine instrument. And after that, it's, magnif uh, it's inspected under handheld or table mounted magnifiers. And before it's handed over to us, instrument description how it has been described in our book. This is the, you can say, the best part of the talk. If you can go and be relatively slow for this, how to describe a surgical instrument. And in, in, in our book, you will find it under three headings for every instrument. It's the key point or the anatomical features of the instrument or the uses, possible functions of the instrument and how to handle proper method of using an instrument. So this is good for any resident, any, uh, you know, ophthalmic assistant, nursing staff, anyone 
who wants to you know experiment with the another surgery so if you know the instrument better then uh, definitely it, it it will do better in your hands the surgery will be better as simple as that so eyelid speculum if we this is the most common you, you can say iske bina to nahi hota na should so eyelid speculum is the first one which we use for intraocular procedures how is it uh, described first you can say categorize it is it adjustable or non adjustable speculum this the d figure d is an adjustable speculum and the figure a and b are non adjustable or wire speculums and pediatric speculum of uh, you can see this figure figure c is the v speculum so the adjustable ones are you can start with this this is the liberman's liberman's speculum is liberman eyelid speculum if you start with this in front of your examiner once you are handed over this instrument then uh, it's a kind of a best start name the instrument try at least uh, yeah you should not say wrong but uh, go for it like don't say it's eyelid speculum it's better if you acknowledge the scientist so that figure a is brackwood crads speculum which doesn't have the blades solid blades the b figure is brackwood speculum which has solid blades this speculum definitely becomes a bit heavier but it keeps the eyelashes away at least from the 12 mm of the corneal diameter 11 mm of the corneal diameter so at least the speculum uh, that speculum will keep the eyelashes away even if it's badly draped i what are the key features so start saying sir ma'am this has got two limbs this the uh, two limbs with adjustable or non adjustable mechanism which are joined at the at one end and open at another end this adjustable speculum is having guard or locking mechanism with a screw and not adjustable is a having a spring mechanism these speculums are universal that is that can be used for both eyes these are light kept lightweight to avoid direct pressure over the globe then you can pause for a bit and then examiner may ask you that okay tell me what are its uses so its use can be divided into therapeutic and diagnostic uh, uses therapeutic one is ophthalmic surgeries for all the foreign body removals if if you want to use it in opd also for intravitreal or subcutaneous injections and in diagnostic you must have seen rop screenings or longer laser procedures or octs in a pediatric uh, patient biometry rarely or examining a patient with spasms and its spasm how to handle this instrument properly the joint end is placed temporally and the open end is with blades it is face it faces nasally and keeps the and the upper blade is inserted first so that the lashes do not interfere with the surgical field when especially when we are doing the surgery cataract surgery under topical anesthesia or something like that so if you describe your instrument in such a way i am sure your examiner will be impressed and will be eager to hand over you another instrument to listen about it so this is a most commonly used another instrument as a forceps once you have applied the speculum next thing is sister please forceps key features are its or the anatomical features are it has also got handle it's a hand there's a handle where the two blades join and it may have grooves like the lower picture down there and or holes to facilitate the grip so this one the with the grooves is the castrovijo design and the holes were also described by castrovijo but not promoted much but this groove design is by the castrovijo design and it has got a shaft which can either be straight or curved the shaft is <laughs> the uh, this thing if you can see my pointer and this thing starting from where the handle ends till the tip or the this uh, you know the business end so this uh, 
this is the joining and this is the handle this is a shaft shaft at the tip of the shaft there's a this is the business end better called as it can be either plain or serrated or has or can have platform like cilia forceps for appellation what you use in the opds it can be notched like this notched at the tip and like this okay not tooth it's not teeth so it is notched like this so the conjunctiva is better held with this this is a ps hoskin forceps uh, very famous uh, forceps for uh, in, in cataract surgeons uh, and the tooth forceps you have to use with caution if you are handling the uh, conjunctiva otherwise for skin and uh, muscle it's okay bishop harman is uh, my favorite and uh, it can be castro visio also so the lower down picture is the bishop harman with the castro visio design and the upper one is the castro visio forceps which was described so you can describe this instrument like it has got a blade it's a stainless steel instrument it has got a uh, joint with two blades and a hold handle or a grooved handle with a straight shaft and a tip with tooth or it is serrated that there is a platform or the tooth uh, or the tip is notched depending upon that the name that and try to name the forceps even if you are not able to tell the name if you describe it in this way it's near to perfect so thalamic specialties for routine you use bear cilia forceps brachial cilia forceps and all the you can read this is a table from the book uh, so we'll go to this uh, image this is a the first one is a I think it's a design is Castro Vigo. This is a titanium forceps, and this is Macpherson's forceps. So B is Moorfields, C is uh, Bishop Harman with with Castro Vigo design. D is the BS cilia forceps with platform. If you are able to see on your screens, <coughs> so the tip of D instrument D is having platform. Tip of instrument b b for bombay is having serrations the instrument of uh, figure e e is having a the shaft is curved okay this is a uh, okay this is a tying forceps castro vigos the f is i think the stoor's uh, superior rectus holding forceps you describe it in same way okay what we are I've emphasized upon uh, the g forceps is uh, colibri forceps it's a smaller version of the limbs forceps uh, h is again bishop harman and i is iol holding forceps okay. it has got serrations over the tip try to describe it in this way so the other very popular instrument over the trolley is needle holder uh, we have opened up anything and we need to close by holding the needle in the needle holder so what are the key features of a needle holder it has got a handle again a handle with the so needle holders what we use generally have got a this leaf <laughs> type of retaining system and it's design you can see in the figure a this design of the handle is brackwer design jose brackwer if you remember that second gentleman's photograph jose brackwer this design is specifically called as brackwer needle forceps brackwer needle holder sorry and the b design look at the handles these are grooves so this is a castro visio type of needle holder so remember these so you can talk about the handle is it flat or round the handles are basically kept long to have a good manual grip and wrist movements and we don't want them to be locked much because uh, micro under microscope you have got finer movements and you don't want the uh, thing to be locked and you need to unlock it while holding the needle so for uh, avoiding any jerky movement uh, we don't want lock 
but you can use this lock uh, needle holder, which keeps the needle more stable while passing through a tougher tissue like skin while closing the defect after taking a skin graft. The C needle holder is called KALT. So first one is uh, Brackworth's. B is Castrovijo, C is called needle holder. Describe it in the same way, handle, then jaws. Jaws are straight or curved. In figure A, it is curved. B is straight. And with the jaws have got inner platforms. Uh, our platforms are there always in the needle holder so that the needle is held properly. It doesn't rotate or slip. And the tip can be fine for the corneal procedures. And standard or the thickness I'm talking about is for the journey procedure by closing any skin, wound, eyelid laceration. Or it, the tip can be heavy to hold the uh, needle of a 4-0 or 3-0 suture. For like called, you can see it uh, in the figure C, the tip is relatively heavy. And A, the figure, uh, tip is fine and curved. And locking mechanism and with or without lock. So the A and B are without lock and C is with lock. Uses, you can hold the body of a needle for passing it through tissues. That's what we do. Commonly used to make needle cystitome like before doing capsular access. Uh, you know, I used to make cystitome with needle holder only. Cystitome of 26 gauge needle tip can be used to hold suture, dosra suture, like one, one we use the suture tying forceps and the other thing we use the needle holder only and can be used to hold the soft tissues like conjunctiva thoda idhar ugar move karne ke liye. And instrument handling, it's very important. The handles of the needles holder are kept long to provide increased maneuverability while passing through delicate ocular structures. It also helps provide desired holding pressure at the jaws with minimum force at the handles. And generally, the rule is there that needle should be held at the two-third and one-third junction. From that, you try to hold the needle. And for spatulated ones, the spatulated needles, they have got a cut section of a kind of a rectangle, so it will not slip. A round body needle holder will make the needle may rotate. A spatulated needle will not rotate. And uh, okay, so now we are. Having some time, we'll talk about sutures and needles. A surgical suture is a medical device that helps to approximate and hold body tissues after a surgery or an injury. So remember two things. You first approximate the wound edges and then you need to hold it in the place. What function does the suture uh, you know, serve? It closes or minimizes or zero down the dead space. If there is no dead space underlying the skin or any muscle which you have sutured, then there are no or very less chances of collection of hematoma and subsequently any development of any uh, infection over there. So in ophthalmology, what we use sutures for is apposition of wound edges, corneal wound of a child, try to suture with even with 10-0 or 9-0 Vigram. Hanging back of tissues is a very specific thing what we do in ophthalmology for like recti. We hang back sometimes you know, while recessing. A resection is different. Recession is different. We may hang back uh, recti or elevators with non-absorbable definitely sutures. And uh, the fixation of a detached structure like canthal tendon or some, some you know, very important tassel plate has uh, detached. We put it back. And we can use it to lift the tissues also, sometimes eyelid or facial skin. So, you know, for face lift also, we use sutures. Uh, they are threaded over the a needle. We pass the needle and uh, take it out the suture. The sutures, they can lift the facial tissue. And uh, you can lift the eyeball also with the sutures passed from the muscle stumps during an inhibition procedure. So, what can be the ideal suture material? The ideal suture material has to be sterile, resistant to infection, 
must have minimum tissue reaction to be non allergenic or non carcinogenic if kept inside like scleral buckle mein hum lagate hain 50 dacron or something dacron is a uh, non absorbable suture it's non allergenic and non carcinogenic it's favorable absorption profile if it is absorb if it is going to uh, absorb then it should not create much of inflammation easy to handle hold securely when knotted must not fray or cut after the knot is tied it should have high tensile strength to bear our uh, movements and it should be definitely affordable to the patient just small uh, thing about terminology of sutures first suture if you are handed over the suture in your examination uh, that can also be done okay remember that just uh, examiner can hand you over a 60 poly uh, galactan or something like that absorbable or non absorbable suture or is it a monofilament or multifilament sutures you can look in the figure this is a example of a monofilament first image is a monofilament and the second filament uh, second image is a multifilament suture or a braided one which you can see uh, its terminologies are many i'll not go into detail but uh, its functions are largely dependent upon its capillarity fluid absorption breaking strength or certain kind of tensile strength half life uh, where the tensile strength reduces to its half of its original value not pull tensile strength but the knot strength is a very important thing that amount of force needed to cause a knot to slip you know when we tie it's not breaking it's slipping you slipping like you have knotted a two ends of a suture what are the chances that this may slip so that uh, is very important it 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 decreases actually when we you know cause much of the bending and twisting of the thread so keep your sutures like flat especially when you are going to keep them inside like in scleral buckle or uh, uh, squint surgeries or levator surgeries even uh, your uh, scleral fixation iols so keep your sutures very uh, importantly straight or avoid bending or twisting its elasticity measure the ability of it measure the ability of suture material to regain its original form and length after deformation that's elasticity and memory is different memory is elasticity plasticity and diameter of suture influence the inherent capability of a suture to return to or maintain its gross shape so the monofilament sutures have more memory they return to its more uh, its position back or the shape back so what are the monofilament sutures nylon proline multifilament uh, your vicryl polygalactan or uh, uh, this uh, dacron uh, that, that these are the multifilament sutures silk also is a multifilament suture if the suture has got higher memory so nylon or uh, proline has got higher memory they are stiffer and requires an extra throw of the suture knot to prevent loosening knot strength is less so just uh, try to put a, a give, throw an extra knot over that uh, i'll be finishing off uh, soon now so the sizes you must have be hearing checking the saman of the patient or you know handing over to the uh, uh, nursing staff opening some sutures in the ot uh, this is the united states pharmacopeia which we use usp is the united states pharmacopeia depending upon that usp designation is right from the bottom of the table it's zero then then zero is one zero okay one zero is nothing like it's a zero then comes two zero three zero four zero five zero six zero six zero is a very commonly used suture in ophthalmic practice uh, like for um, strabismus uh, five zero is also important for uh, uh buckle surgeries 70 and 80 for suturing conjunctiva wound and glaucoma filtration surgeries 90 and 10 for suturing cornea and uh, uh, scleral fixation iols 110 I, i don't know. so what are its diameters these are the zeros are united states pharmacopeia actually its diameter of any absorbable 
or a non absorbable suture is generally safe it's you can see right from here from the okay from the bottom of the table to the top the diameter remains same of a suture if it's absorbable or non absorbable because its usb uh, size is same if it is 60 suture then its diameter cut diameter is 0.07 mm you can remember these two at least 60 has got diameter of 0.07 mm and 10 has got diameter of 0.02 mm 0.02 and 0.07 at least remember these two you can impress your uh, examiner probably and uh, yourself also this is this is a thing which you know probably your nursing staff might also not be knowing tell them tomorrow when you go to ot or uh, clinic back this is what we follow usp united states pharmacopeia another one is i think uk pharmacopeia uh, we generally word by this is follow okay so thank you slide and thank you for the patient uh, listening i hope i have not bored you uh, this was a very different topic sir told me that uh, you talk about this and uh, i i love to share this uh, i i i actually went quite deep into that because i was not knowing anything before uh, i i went into the you know that stuff really that ye uh, hai kya because i need to write a book now. i have to know so that was the thing i think i am my done for today so second part will continue with the uh, another thing it will be very exciting we'll focus on sterilization which is very important and uh, for lifelong practice i must say i have changed i i have changed my you know how i look on to the at the trolley at the ot and how the sister gives me when it's packed in a plasma or a, a linen you know instruments are handed over to me and uh, i can conduct a zero infection camp <laughs> if you know your instruments that's what i told in the first slide if you know your tools you will be uh, confident and thank you so very much sir for uh -huh. such a brilliant lecture and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed the detailing of each instrumentation part by part and uh, i think it is quintessential for any uh, postgraduate who is entering into ophthalmology to know the tools as you put it not only for the examinations part but it is like a daily thing it is like a man wearing his own tie absolutely so uh, sir we have a few questions from the audience Uh, yeah. may I please proceed uh, uh, with asking them. Yeah, yeah, sure. So one question is: Can you please explain about the various types of phaco tips and sleeves? Uh, okay, then we can cover it in the next topic. Uh, next, uh, that phaco tips and sleeves. We'll focus over that. It's there in the book. Everything is there in the book. I can. That's free to download from the Springer website, and I'll show it on the screen also right now. and uh, i will uh, definitely put more focus on describing the phaco tips on the next lecture that will be great sir so uh, similarly one of the viewers has asked what are the different types of irrigation and aspiration cannulae again that uh, so uh, okay i'll show now only can okay. i uh, is my slide visible uh, no. not currently sir if you can share your screen that will be of great help okay Oh, now I share, and uh, I'll share the book. That's a PDF. So this is the book. Like you can download it; it's free. Uh, I literally gave up any of the royalty. You know, Springer gives you royalty, पैसे मिलते हैं. But I, me and Doctor Parul literally gave it up. कि it should be freely uh, available to the residents and whosoever wants to learn this. about this because it it will be uh, more the focus is uh, on the residents for this and the staff ot staff so they will not pay for downloading this 
<laughs> so it's the first chapter is on instrument sterilization and care. Uh, what we were talking about was the anterior segment or the phaco tips. Hmm? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that last one is last chapter is about the yeah. This is elastic. Or the is ophthalmic instrumentation and the tools. So basically. Uh, I took some liberty, talk to the publisher and uh, get these equipments also. Equipment wala chapter humne last mein dal diya tha. So let me show you this if, yeah. So basic operating room machines. In this, we have covered this and we have tried to give any, pra the practical pearls also. So I'll share it with you in the next lecture and uh, let me show you it was about phaco emulsification machine it's big basic components so that fluidics ultrasonic phaco hand piece and tips it will come in here so tips has got its frequency stroke length and uh, this is a kind of a jumbled up image tips ke bare mein, because i have not written this uh, okay so i think know it was dealing with this I'll put up the images of tips and uh, I can tell you this, at least there's a straight tip and there are, there are angled tips. The angled tips, what they do is uh, deliver the energy to the nucleus in an efficient way with the same amount of movement caused by vibration of that piezoelectric crystal. Where is the piezoelectric crystal? So this is a phaco handpiece. Is it visible? Yes, sir. So fake is metal hub. Mein, is mein, there are multiple piezoelectric crystals. So electricity goes there and it makes them vibrate over a very specific frequency of 20,000 to 40,000 hertz. This uh, vibration is delivered to the phaco tip. If it's a straight tip and a, uh, you have put a curved tip or a straight tip, then the curved tip, angled tip will deliver more energy with lesser amount of dissipation to the nucleus for its emulsification. That is one thing. And Kelman has, uh, you know, modified its tip. Uh, it, you can have a bent Kelman tip with a kind of a, a slight deviation at the tip that helps in delivering more energy to the nucleus per se. The tip has got an external diameter. If you can see, this is the, this is the internal diameter and this, this is the whole length is the external diameter. So the internal diameter is only it as for the aspiration from where the energy is delivered is by this much thickness. How thick is the tip? I'm talking about acoustic energy. Okay. Acoustic energy will be delivered by the thickness of that tip. That's why there was one time when a cobra tip, cobra tip was nothing but a flanged tip, flanging, you know, uh, wo, humara, uh, a trumpet is there. So, thoda sa tip ko flange kar diya tha, so that there is more uh, delivery of the energy to the nucleus. So, you can have a simply a straight tip or an angled tip, angled tip also with the Kelman design, which has got a slight uh, curve on the at the tip, and with the flange, it's called as cobra. Tip. Everything is done to increase the efficiency of these piezoelectric crystals. What the frequency is delivered to the tip. That is, uh, you know, about the tip and sleeve over it. It keeps. The tip, because that's a coaxial uh, system, what we are talking about here is a, a coaxial FICO emulsification tip, where uh, on one axis only, there is a uh, FICO emulsification. The aspiration is also going from the same axis. The irrigation is also happening from the same axis. This is a coaxial type of uh, mechanism. 
the another one is bimanual that's a different so sleeves uh, basically play a very important role as far as the corneal incision is concerned so tip is different uh, as far as the corneal incision what we make because if it's 2.2 then we use uh, for alcon machines we use a pink tip or earlier we used to use 2.8 for purple tip and a blue tip for 3 mm incisions but 2.8 and uh, 3 is gone now so we usually you go for two or sub 2 mm incisions these are coaxial systems i hope uh, relatively i am clear but for next time i am uh, and show some images thank you so much sir this is an absolute gold mine of a book that every postgraduate student should definitely download it is very kind of sir and ma'am that they have put it across without seeking any form of royalty and uh, published it so beautifully well compiled with so many photographs together i would request every postgraduate student to just sit down every day just have a look at the photographs of uh, have a visual impact a pictographic memory before the examinations as well uh before we conclude today sir i would like to make a small announcement that we meet next on the 28th of july on the essentials of ophthalmic instruments part 2 by your learned self we are hoping to see you right across and we are glued to our screens to witness yet another beautiful session by you sir thank you so much thank you and uh, i hope the other questions we can um, answer in the next uh, talk and uh, that will be lovely yes sir yes sir very very truly said sir so i'll keep my talk a bit shorter so that we can interact more in the sure. next so i'll focus on the questions if you can just uh, briefly tell me anything else of, of, uh, except for the fico tips and tubings uh, yes sir that are the two questions which multiple people have asked and okay. there have been questions regarding the instrumentation for dcr okay that also i'll cover yes specifically Okay. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank okay. You, sir. Good night. Good night, Thank sir. You. See you on the other Good side. Good night. Good night. Enjoy your dinner. Bye, bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, bye, sir.